There we go. Um, thank you for facilitating, Jen. Um, I am Gina Fiorelli Duranlo. I am the Clean Program Coordinator. Um, so I'm at these calls every week. Um, and I work with Katie, who's over to my right, um, at Series Education and Outreach, um, which is at University of Colorado Boulder, but I work remotely from Vermont. Um, and, and I'll pass it over to Don, who's next to me. Hi, I'm Don Haas. I'm the Director of Teacher Programming at the Paleontological Research Institution in Ithaca, though I telecommute from Buffalo, and the snow is actually looking like you might be able to see it on the camera. There is snow falling, but not sticking in the flow today for the first time. And I will pass it to uh, Carolyn. So I live in Florida. Um, it's about 80 degrees outside, uh, which is a blessing and a curse because um, a lot of the cute stuff that I would want to wear for Halloween will give me heat stroke. Um, I work for the Clio Institute, which is a nonprofit center uh, headquartered in Florida. We do climate education and advocacy, and I am in charge of, uh, I'm the education and curriculum manager. Oh, and I do use uh, she, her pronouns, and in the chat, I'm not wearing a costume now, but I did do a photo shoot with my long-suffering cat. Um, that The background is edited. The costume is actually real. Um, I think, uh, Nelson, have you gone yet? Okay. Hey, thanks, Carolyn. Um, hi, my name is Nelson Melendez. Um, I'm I work at the Nature Conservancy. I'm the um, uh, education and outreach specialist, a part of the youth engagement um, team. And um, yeah, I'm just happy to be here, happy to share and, and learn from everyone. Uh, my work with, with, um, with the Conservancy is mainly around managing a, um, an education youth platform called Nature Lab. And there's where we house all our youth curriculum work. And uh, a lot of our lesson plans are um, based on climate change issues and, and climate change education, but also like a wide array of just environmental science um, from K to 12, um, from grades K to 12. So yeah, happy to be here, happy to chat with everybody and learn. Apologies, and then I, I, will, I will popcorn it over to Tiffany. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, Tiff Boyd, she, her pronouns, Classrooms for Climate Action in Louisville, Colorado. And um, sorry, I just took my entire beak costume off. We were downtown at the Halloween parade, raising money to put solar panels on two of the schools in our community. Sorry, and I came late, so whoever's hasn't um, gone. Let's see, know. maybe Katie. Yeah, I haven't gone yet. I can go. Hi, everyone. I'm Katie Boyd. I am the clean program manager. And um, also, I mean, we're based at Serious Education and Outreach, as Gina mentioned. And I um, also otherwise work on some of our other projects as an evaluation, um, as an evaluator and help with research as well. So that's the other part of my job. And I use she, her pronouns based in Boulder, Colorado, the um, traditional lands of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Ute. And I had it on. I am a shark this year. Um, yeah, happy Halloween. And let's see. Um, Don, did you go yet? You did. Er, uh, let's see. I know Tim put his in the chat. Rachel put hers in the chat. Maybe Rachel? Rachel Woman, are you? available oh no rachel put hers in the chat too um emily right, thanks katie i figured i'd go um, <laughs> um my name is emily snow brenneman i use she her pronouns i'm with the ucar center for science education in boulder colorado i'm a program specialist and exhibit manager so we have a small set of uh, we have a small visitor center in boulder um the in Mesa lab and we have some exhibits on climate and weather and sonar connections and then we also have a wealth of resources for educators and the general public on our website and we work with um educators that come to to the mesa lab as well um and bring field trips so we do a lot of different things um on our team. and let's see 
I know I think, I'm getting down to who. I think who else Eric and talk. Lynn have not introduced themselves okay. yet. I can jump in. I'm off camera okay, right now. I'm do, doing some cooking. I have a, a wife that teaches kindergarten and she's super busy with Halloween. So I said I get dinner going early. Um, I'm based in Oakland, California, informal science educator for uh, 30 plus years with a space and science center in Oakland and with a um, nonprofit that does a lot of uh, teacher support programs. Also one of our clean ambassadors for the last uh, year or so. So see many of you on calls and help facilitate. Um, so I'll pass it over to Lynn. Oh, you're muted, Lynn. Lynn, you're muted. <laughs> I'm here for the first time and I'm uh, looking to find out more about this organization. So I'll just be listening. I live in, um, I live near Santa Fe um, and I'm retired <laughs> and publishing uh, around evolution and the uh, need to um, make sure that that our theory of evolution uh, conforms as closely as possible with nature because otherwise we will be trying to uh, do corrections on climate change and using not the best possible information. So that's what I'm interested in. But today I just want to listen to what y'all have to say. <clears throat> Thank okay, you. great. Thanks, Lynn, for uh, joining us today. I know we don't have a formal presentation planned. I, we're going to have an informal convo. But first, um, thanks, everyone. I think everyone introduced themselves. Um, and uh, now we can move into announcements. So, Don, did you have an announcement? I think you were about to do an announcement before. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a, a happy one. Um, PRI has uh, suddenly hit some pretty serious substantial uh, financial issues we've uh, um, and the formal announcement on it I just put in the chat um, we've uh, had a a long-term anonymous a set of anon anonymous donors who have given us 30 million dollars over the last couple of decades and the short version is they've suddenly stopped it and it's uh, not not of their own choosing um, but that has serious implications for, for us. And I'm going to three days a week starting next week and unsure of uh, uh, that that will last through the rest of the calendar year. And then it's a question mark after that. So I, uh, I may be looking for work. Um, so if you hear of things, keep me in mind. Uh, and in the short term, um, uh, 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 consulting and speaking uh, type things are, are great. Um, but uh, in the longer term, I'm unsure. So, uh, so hopefully somebody has uh, cheerier news. <laughs> so sorry to hear that, Don. Yeah, that is uh, a major disappointment. Bummer. Yeah, came up very suddenly, or came to yeah. a head very suddenly. Yeah, that's really terrible. Yep. Well, hopefully it will be able to write write itself. Yeah. Somehow mm -hmm. magically. Yeah. Yeah, well, um, if, uh, if the 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 a slightly longer version of the story is that uh, the anonymous donors have had a business deal hung up for much longer than expected, and if that actually comes through, then uh, the funding will come back. <laughs> um, one of the few times I will um, root for some capitalism, I guess. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um. So let's see, other announcements? I can go. Um, uh, Don and some of us have been working hard on uh, the Excels Summit, which is, I just put a link to the registration in the chat. So um, the Excel Summit is something that Clean ha is putting together again for the second year. Um, it's uh, an acronym for the Accelerating Climate Capacity Engagement and Leadership Summit. 
um, and um, we hosted it in September last year, and some of you were there. We're going to host a kickoff event um, in November next month. That's uh, the registration that I just put in the chat is registration for the November 16th kickoff event um, where we'll hear from a panel. Um, we are going to hear from some folks who have submitted proposals to lead working groups. Uh, we have topics, a few different topics. See if I can remember some of them right now. There's climate change and mental health, climate change communication, um, creating inventories for uh, climate change lesson plans for teachers. Um, there's a group working on uh, climate change projects in rural communities. Um, and I'm forgetting the fifth one, but that's uh, the generally- The DEI and action yes. focus group. There's a DEI and climate action group that has a focus as well that uh, Rachel is helping lead. I think Eric's involved in that one too. So um, lots of good stuff going on there. Um, basically last year at the event, we had more of a traditional summit format where we had uh, speakers and some workshops and all of that. Um, but uh, we learned from evaluations that people really wanted the opportunity to uh, work together more and have more collaboration spaces. So we, we are doing a, um, a launch event for working groups instead who will meet regularly throughout the winter into the spring and we'll have a, a wrap up share out in the spring as well that uh, everyone will be invited to. So whoever is available and wants to join on November 16th, I'm really trying to get our registration numbers up. So please consider attending and participating. Um, please consider sharing um, as well with your networks. Everyone is invited, clean community and beyond. Um, um, so reach out with any questions, but please do consider registering for that. And that's it, thank you. Great, uh, other announcements? So I do have some happier news there, or maybe proto news is the word for it is, um, I, uh, we presented with the CREC group uh, maybe a month ago on a clean call, something like that. And it continues to be very encouraging, I think. Uh, uh, and that's the Climate Resilience Education Task Force, which is working for climate change education in New York State. And I think we will have a bill number, um, meaning that the bill will actually be introduced sometime in the next week or two. Um, and we have lined up lots of sponsors and um, gotten uh, some outside groups uh, supporting it uh, behind it. And I'm cautiously optimistic and the stuff in the, uh, the, the platform is all in the bill. It includes $20 million a year for uh, climate change education, which the lion's share of which will go to teacher professional development. Um, and create, creating a resource hub. And I'm crossing my fingers that uh, the bill is going to be introduced uh, very, very soon. And it'll, it'll pass in, my, crossing my fingers, it'll pass in the spring. So that is good news. That's awesome, Don. Yeah. I'll go next. Yeah. Um, we've had a chance, you know, thinking about working systemically to work with uh, Cool Boulder, which is a branch of the Boulder, um, the city of Boulder municipality. And there's a head of it named Brett Ken Cairn, and he's very, very focused on uh, connected canopies, absorbent landscapes, and pollinator pathways, and helping uh, center a lot of our work out of schools so that um, kids are learning about nature-based climate solutions. They're the cornerstone of some of this work. Um, so that's been a kind of a cool, Thing for us to be involved in sort of that systemic larger um, larger action. And then the other thing that we've started to get involved in, which is kind of exciting, is thinking about what is our role with um, trying to get more retired teachers activated in this work. And so we've also uh, been working with Third Act, which some of you know about is Bill McGibbon's group that's working with, um, with older adults and more multi-generational work. So yeah, just trying to work work smarter, not harder. <laughs> I can share an announcement on our end. Um, so our uh, Nature Lab team recently released a virtual field trip about regenerative agriculture in the last two weeks. 
And I'll share that link here as well. Um, so the YouTube link goes to the video and there's also a link in the description to our to our other resources. Um, but um, the, vi the video is focused on a, a bit of a history of agriculture, uh, different just general like climate change related issues with with agriculture and like modern agriculture and what changes need, should be made to um, lessen our carbon footprint and there's an attached teacher's guide as well with the um with the with the lesson plan um in our website too which i can share that link here as well but yeah and i also shared that i shared it within the network uh via email yesterday too so we're really excited for this launch and uh love to share our resources with, with anyone that's involved Yeah, it was really great, Nelson. Thank you for um, thanks for sharing it. We I was excited to see it, and I look through, I watched the video, and look through the guide, and um, sent it to some folks already. So hopefully, it'll get some use soon. Um, other announcements from the group? Could just do a quick one. Um, our this this coming Saturday. So if you're in the Boulder area, um, we have our Super Science Saturday event that's coming. That's going to be happening this Saturday. It's the first time we've since COVID that we are we're now back in person. So we're really excited about that. And we're our theme is Return of the Science. And so we're going to have a slight Star Wars theme going on as well. Um, so it should be fun. Um, we're hoping people come dressed up and it's all about celebrating science. And we're going to have our annual ping pong launch as well. So there'll be ping pong balls flying everywhere outside. So, <laughs> and I'll put the link in the chat too. That sounds so fun. I like the idea that there's ping pongs everywhere. Um, other not, not fun to clean up, but it's fun yes. to just watch. Fun to do, right. <laughs> Uh, other announcements? I have a, I have a few. Um, we're deep into Youth Climate Summit season. So, you know, we have our Adirondack Youth Climate Summit. It's the 13th year that we've done this two-day event. We have, um, it's full. <laughs> Last year, we kind of had a scaled-down version because as we were coming out of the pandemic. But this year, we are full with around 170 plus teachers and students from 27 to 28 different school districts, um, 15 different workshops, like loads of plenary sessions, a tabling, community tabling session. So that's happening next week, November 8th and 9th. And I will, we will be live streaming some of the, um, some of the plenary sessions. So I will uh, post those on the clean network when I have the final schedule, of course. Um, and then actually tomorrow will be the Finger Lakes Youth Climate Summit that will be held at the Finger Lakes Institute. My our climate team is heading there uh, momentarily to lead a one-day summit. And then the week after that, we have a yet another summit at the Frontenac Arch Biosphere Reserve in Ontario, in Kempville, Ontario, which we are also partnering um, with them on Youth Summit. So it's a busy three weeks of um, Youth Climate Summits. Um, so I'll put the link to the Adirondack Summit on the um, in the chat here in a second. But other announcements, are there any other announcements? No. So I think, um, oh, can I, oh can yeah, I go ahead. One? Sorry, sorry, Katie. No, I'm sorry. I've been trying to eat a snack as well as, um, be um, we have our, um, introduction to clean webinar coming up next week. So I just wanted to put that out there real quick. Um, and if people know about, um, our clean webinars, we usually have a series of like, um, four or so, four or five um, each semester. And then um, <clears throat> this year we're not doing that. We're just having one per semester and we're revamping things and we're gonna develop an asynchronous professional development workshop. So that will launch hopefully like late spring and into like early next school year. But um, we are still having our introduction to clean webinar. So if you know folks who are interested in sort of um, teach about climate and energy and want to get a you know 20 or so minute look at um, how to navigate through clean and utilize clean for their teaching practice and um, this is a great webinar for that and it's coming up next week so please spread the word awesome thanks katie 
Um, okay, so Gina, did we decide on a topic? <laughs> yeah, I was thinking we could just do um, talk about we haven't had a conversation about uh, informal learning spaces in a very long time. I thought you would be a great person to um, lead a discussion like that. Um, sure. I have one uh, one thing that Katie and I were talking about, um, and we don't have to have a specific direction, uh, but maybe you know more about this too, Jen, but there's um, the new seating action toolkit that has that came out of the ASTC conference. Um, I can put a link to that as well, but we're, um, Queen has been kind of try getting connected a little bit there too. Um, I can put a link to that in the chat, but um, yeah, challenges and opportunities in informal learning spaces. Yeah, maybe. so yeah, thanks for bringing up the Aztec piece. So at the recent um, Association of Science and Technology Center conference, which was held uh, a few weeks ago in um, Charlotte, New North Carolina, um, they launched a new um, like planetary health initiative. They actually had Dr. Katherine Wilkinson from All We Can Save was one of the keynote speakers, and they did a. F they also had the um, director, and of course, I'm forgetting her name, but the director of NC um, NCA five. So the next. Um, uh, National Climate Assessment led a session alongside Rose Hendricks, who, Dr. Rose Hendricks, who's from Aztec, um, kind of thinking and talking about the, you know, the role of museums in the climate change education space. Historically, science centers, and those of you that work with science centers or have worked in science centers know that overall, they've been kind of dinosaur-y, you know, no pun intended there, but on the, um, on the, like, moving on climate. There's a lot of um, like red tape or there's a lot of kind of like, oh, should we take action or we can't take a stand or is this advocacy or we don't know. Anyway, so any, this is, I think, Aztec kind of shifting into this new mode of um, trying to galvanize and create some momentum within the Aztec, within the science and technology center community to launch this new initiative. And there are, there is, um, so I think they have a whole uh, website. Uh, yeah, it was a really good conference. Yep. And Emily, jump right in if you want to, you, you were probably, I'm sure you were also at that session at, with Rose and um, who's the director from the NCA5? Do you remember her name? I'm having a blank right now. At any rate, she was there, seating action. But there is funding coming out of this. And actually, Aztec has other funding currently available focused on community science that's available in um, that that funding opportunity in community science. The deadline is early no early December, December 4th or 5th, I think. And then the planetary health initiative, the seating action, is like another round of funding that they're going to be launching in the near future. They've just gotten this initiative off the ground. So, um, you know, if you're in the science center space, this is worth taking a look at um, in terms of, you know, potential funding opportunities, or if your institution wants to sign up. Um, again, uh, it's fairly broad at the moment. Thoughts, comments? Emily, do you have anything? Um, to add to that or Don, or Don, I know you weren't at the conference, but you might know about it or anybody else that was there or and or knows about some of this work happening in the museum spaces. I don't have anything <clears throat> I think specific to add other than that it was great to see the focus shift <laughs> that uh, it was just really refreshing. <laughs> <clears throat> I think oftentimes um, that, you know, the science center community or the informal learning community in general gets kind of, when people say climate change education, they're typically talking about like, or 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 it's assumed that they're talking about like K-12 in schools, climate change education. But the role of all of our organizations, and most of us are in the informal learning um, space, I think, um, are is really important in that partnerships with educators. And I think that's something that 
um, you know, I know there's a lot of expertise on this call, but I do think that it's something, especially as we're, you know, looking at, for example, the Cruft Initiative to write legislation on climate change education in New York State or other initiatives on climate change education in the state. It's like, what's the role of the informal learning community in supporting that, helping to lead that, be a partner in that, a collaborator? And so I'd be curious to hear sort of people's thoughts or if they're currently working on initiatives um, within their states that are that are um, focused on climate change education um, in a broader context other than within your institutions. Yeah, I'll just um, note that the National Wildlife Federation um, has funded some of the correct work, which is incredibly helpful for the logistics and planning of, of all that stuff. And um, um, and nonprofits can be involved in advocacy. Yeah, if they're careful and smart about it, um, can't spend more than 10% of your uh, funding on lobbying related uh, work, but you can do stuff. And Eric Pyle and I actually wrote a chapter about uh, that related stuff a couple of years ago um, in the book edited by Joe Henderson. And I'm forgetting who the other editor was, but uh, Andrea, um, Andrea Andrew. Dawes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, so yeah, uh, you can do stuff and should. A lot of the work that we've been focused on is to build the human infrastructure and the capacity to, oh, go ahead, Jen, did you wanna share something? You're on mute. That, that Sorry, I was just trying to sh share the book. Yeah, that's the book I mentioned, yes. That Don mentioned, sorry. In, in the US. No, no, you're all good. It's good to to add that on. Um, I think part of what we've been seeing is that teachers are like, we don't want one more link to click on. We don't want one more bit of curriculum. We want humans in the classroom to do this with us. And we don't want it to be a one-off. We want it to be integrated into what we're already teaching. And so we've been really working on building the human capacity to because teachers are absolutely tapped. And there are heroic teachers in every building that are doing an amazing job at climate change education. But overall, people are asking for humans, not for more curriculum, not for more links to click on. They're asking for humans, humans in the classroom. And so we've been trying to build out that the people capacity of teachers. And so that's what we've been sort of working on. How do you have a model that replicates bringing community members into the schools to help teachers connect the education piece, the science of climate, um, to the civic engagement, you know, to getting students involved with what's happening in their community, with wildfire mitigation, with emergency preparedness, uh, with greenhouse gas reduction projects. Um, and that takes humans and it takes the capacity that teachers don't have. So we're really working on that, the human infrastructure piece. Go ahead, Eric. Yeah, that Tiffany, what you're saying is 100% like resonating with me too. Like, uh, it's great that Aztec has this initiative. It's kind of full circle. I think my first or second Aztec conference was in Charlotte like 20 years ago or something. And back then we were putting up, you know, walls and saying, we need more sustainability at Aztec. We need to talk about the earth. We need to talk about climate. And it was not central to museum works, even science center work at that time. Uh, but shortly thereafter, I think it, it, the momentum really started to pick up. And um, and we're the same approach, Tiffany, exactly as you described it. Like, uh, I think one of the things that's neat about informal education centers, science centers, is we're sort of like the canaries in the coal mine. We have an opportunity to drive things and sort of look forward, have the freedom and latitude to try out new programming, to be more integrative in our thinking and approach to teaching. Whereas school districts are these huge, cumbersome you know, monoliths that kind of you know, have trajectories of their own and bureaucracies to, that we have to kind of navigate through. There's four districts in California, so three in the Bay Area and one LA that have climate initiatives and resolutions that say we want K-12 uh, climate curriculum. And that we're working on a project statewide with with 10 strands to, to do exactly that. Don's involved in that network. Um, and so it's again, it's pushing, it's it's pushing the envelope. And teachers are calling for exactly same same here in California. Like, 
they're so burnt out. They don't know how to integrate things. They have all these obligations, you know, ever expanding obligations to sort of teach the basic stuff in, in a challenging environment in the school districts, but they love to get together. I just had a whole weekend of, of programming at my science center, these different collaborative networks that are all working on climate justice, climate change education, Saturday and Sunday, they got together. And the best part is, is exactly like you described it. They get to meet with each other, share, share practice with each other. Uh, us dipping into the classroom is huge, but also them getting out and networking with each other in spaces where you've got like-minded folks that are thinking and trying to do things is really, really powerful. So that that model of a building, kind of like what Gina said and Tiffany uh, and Katie said about this new approach with CLEAN, which is to bring us together as PLCs, professional learning communities. Uh, that's what teachers need, year-round support, year-round integration, uh, the ability to work together, you know, explicitly share best practice because they're they're the professionals, right? And just that little extra scaffold of saying, hey, this other person's doing it in this other district. That's really cool. You know, those opportunities to really share best practice and build together. And then the power of collectivity to just, I'm not the only one. You know, I know that, that you know, Caroline, you've, you, Caroline, you've expressed all the, the challenges of being in Florida, but then, uh, which is true across our country, even in California in different parts, right? So, but the, for us to be collectively working together with the teachers, with each other, it really helps move the work forward and, and keep us engaged and inspired. So, so thanks, Tiffany. I really appreciate those thoughts. Other, um, other comments around this or thoughts? Tiffany, can you talk a little bit more about your initiative? Sure. Yeah. So, um, so our group right now, we got, um, uh, so Jessica Bean and Melissa Bratton are two professors that are trying to do an IRB to, to study a little bit about how this network of retirees and community members is really able to wrap around classroom teachers and offer that support and the bridge to these outside resources. Um, so we're kind of trying to uh, capsulate what we've been doing and how it's been working and then hoping to get it out there in a way to kind of replicate uh, what we're doing. But I think the biggest thing that we keep hearing from teachers is we couldn't do this without you. So if you're going to have really rich project-based learning where kids are connected to the actual um, climate phenomenons in their in their community, uh, you know, the, we need other people besides the teachers <laughs> to connect them to this work. Um, so yeah, so kind of what we've been doing is trying to build out a model because, you know, when you think about if it's replicable or if it's scalable, they're kind of one in the same, but you only know what your local climate phenomenon are in your community. So getting people other than teachers to identify those, come into schools, um, help connect kids to that work, um, to that uh, literal hands-on work. Like we have everything from having kids pull cheat grass uh, to do wildfire mitigation, to having kids testify in front of city council for flood mitigation, you know, thinking about the umbrella of climate education in terms of, you know, mitigation, adaptation, emergency preparedness, all the things like every community has these things going on. And how do we connect kids and teachers to that work? And so that's a big piece of what we're doing because schools, schools are the hub of the community, right? And so it's a matter of making sure that teachers have the capacity. Um, and actually, they don't have the capacity. So it's expanding the capacity beyond, beyond the classroom so that uh, schools and families and teachers can be a part of this local climate action. I've been wondering now with the, um, well, two things that I have been thinking about recently. One is the new, you know, Climate Core initiative, um, which I'm curious about how that might expand capacity 
in communities or create opportunities to expand capacity for those um, staff capacity on this sort of informal ed side to help work and be doing climate change education in the classroom and or outside of school time, like leading community based project learning, doing work within communities, supporting resilience building. I mean, it's one of the things that we've been talking about here at the Wild Center. So that was one thing I was thinking about. Um, I'm just curious if anyone else has been following the Climate Corps. Maybe you guys did a session here on it. I don't know, but um, in clean because I um, have missed a bunch calls, but I um, was curious if anyone has been thinking about that or um, where your thoughts are on, on the role of the new Climate Corps. I read through kind of what, what they were proposing and where they're going to be offering support, and it doesn't look like there's a link to schools, although, you know, a bridge between AmeriCorps and Climate Corps would be great, right? So that you're you're linking the students to these projects that are happening in their community. Um, I don't think that that schools are a part of the Climate Corps outreach, but I think that uh, that would be amazing, right? Was anyone else thinking along the Climate Corps line? either in school or not in school. I haven't read that much into it, Tiffany. We just launched an AmeriCorps program in August. So I'm sort of, <laughs> we're thinking more right now about that, but I am trying to keep my eye on that climate course stuff. So it's interesting to hear about um, that it's not school focused. The other one I was recently curious about, um, and maybe others have it, is that the DOE's new uh, Green Ribbon Schools is now announced a category for informal learning institutions. Um, and, um, and I just didn't know if anybody knew much about that or has been following that new announcement that came like in the last month-ish, maybe a little longer. <laughs> I can see if I can find that particular announcement. It is interesting because I think it, you know, like there's a whole DOE Green Ribbon Schools program that was just focused on schools, but now they're adding organizations to that list. Um, so it is it is a cool opportunity. There is funding um, paired with it. I don't think they've made the, um, you know, sort of the call for proposals yet, but I'm just flagging that for this community. Um, because it is something that you know many of many of folks within the clean network would be eligible for. Yeah, I didn't realize that I've heard of the green, green ribbon schools, but never looked like that much into it. But that's interesting. They've added other organizations as well. Thanks for that heads up, Jen. I wanted to go back to something you talked about at the beginning of this, Jen, if others don't have thoughts that they want to jump in with, um, that when I was working in a museum, I think, you know, some of it you were saying, it's like, yeah, oh, we don't want to like jump into like advocacy. And I just think so much of that is like, it's interesting. It's such a delicate balance for informal learning institutions because there's such a trusted source in the community at like resource for information. And that's part of the way that they're so powerful, but it also has those like strings, you know, because I think that's where a lot of hesit hesitation comes in around like jumping into topics, co more controversial topics like climate change. And, um, you know, even Lynn mentioned like evolution. I know like NCSE <laughs> as a, organization that often joins clean calls they work a lot on that one as well you know but just some of these like it's like it's so interesting how you kind of try to need to try to balance the trust that that the community has in you and not sort of overstepping bounds but also then being that trusted source of information and you know being able to 
talk about things that are so important, like climate change, you know, it's just such an important topic. And it's one of the few places people do engage with science and in information is in, you know, these um, informal learning institutions, at least outside of school. Um, and, but so much of our learning actually happens outside of school. So it's like, it's just such a, anyways, I don't really know what, like, I'm not asking a question. <laughs> necessarily it's more of just a comment but like that, that's what I noticed it's just like such a paradox of like oh we're so trusted so we should talk about these things and we're also trusted so we like can't talk about some things because like you know we don't want to like have people lose their trust in us um so I don't right. I don't and know like how you fine, get past that it's such a fine line because it's like you know as you know, obviously things have become even more polarized and like even sort of science in general has become more polarized across like the political spectrum because so now it's even, I feel like it's even potentially harder at the same time, like, you know, I mean, as, as Don pointed out, you do within being a 501c3, there's a certain percentage of your time that can be utilized in advocacy work. The other thing is, is like somehow like advocacy work you know, you can do civic engagement around science and it not be advocacy. Like if that's where the red flags are, which is I, in my sort of limited experience, like the red flags are generally around like, oh, you're advocating for a particular person or a particular, you know, particular person is really what the right. issue is. Like you can't do that, but you can advocate for like, you know, good science in schools, like, that's not, it's not like you can't do that. And there's like a whole range of civic engagement actions that science centers or informal learning or museums or whatever spaces can do outside of those space, you know, outside of it. So anyway, I see Don has his hand up. Yeah, I've got, uh, I've got lots of thoughts. Um, we've done lots of work on controversial issues that really, you know, um, uh, PRI is sort of built around evolution. So um, so we've been doing that for the entire 92-year uh, history of the organization or whatever it is. And, uh, and then we got into fracking education 10 years ago. Our book was actually published 10 years ago this month. Um, and, uh, uh, and, you know, people were like, why do you get involved in controversial issues so much you know climate change evolution fracking and uh, the the bottom line is those issues are controversial because they're important um, people care about them um, so uh, when people care about things and have different ideas about those things that uh, that breeds controversy and trying to you know figure out how to how to walk that line is really challenging and and we don't always get it right, of course. Um, uh, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't go there. Um, and I'm also you know, sort of free associating a little bit that uh, um, Katie Worth, who wrote uh, this book, <laughs> um, Miseducation, How Climate Change is Taught in America, has an article in the uh, current Scientific American on uh, earth science in uh, textbooks in uh, middle middle school and high school textbooks and with a special focus on Texas. And uh, um, and the article came out uh, a little over a week ago, I think, and, and notes that the uh, um, Texas text board, textbook adoption public meeting is sometime in November. And you still have time to <laughs> to influence the decisions made on the the buying of those books, and that's you know that's a piece of uh, citizen action uh, that you know grounded in science, hopefully, uh, which there are some serious problems in um, many of the textbooks out there. Um, so anyway, I feel like I'm babbling, but anyway, some some thoughts there. <laughs> I'll see if I can find it or other um, thoughts or comments from folks around this, you know, how is, how is it showing up in your organizations? 
How is advocacy showing up in these or in your organizations around climate change education? Um, so we, you know, we we own that we do a lot of advocacy. Um, we actually are. I'm not entirely sure how like the organizational structure works, but we're starting sort of a C4 arm and trying to keep everything very separate between, we call it like your sort of grassroots advocacy versus, you know, work more on specific candidates. But I found um, some really successful framing uh, because we do a lot of civic engagement, advocacy, education, where we're doing it on a very local level and you know, for example, the, the presentation I gave last fall, um, talking about students measuring air quality, um, when you can try to boil it, you know, get away from like big national issues and talk about what's happening in your community. Uh, also in Florida, um, on the state level, obviously things are difficult, but we've had a lot of success at the municipal level. So you get kids or, you know, just citizens of your community that are talking about what directly affects them and their families. And it's a lot harder to argue that this is political when they're literally saying, you know, for example, this is an air pollution reading I got near my home and this is how it makes me feel rather than talking about, you know, I, I, again, issues that kind of, you know, trigger people um, on, on, the, on the politics. So that, that can be a good, a good framing. Thanks, Carolyn. Other folks that are, are doing this work? What's happening for you? Well, I'll just jump in and say this is just something that our team has been struggling with just because of our funding. Um, we have to walk the fine line of not not advoc just no advocacy. So we're but trying to walk that fine line of we focus, or we're really focusing on telling the stories, really. Um, and similar with, with what Carolyn was saying, and so that triggered that. I was like, yeah, we're just focusing on telling the stories. Um, I mean, we have within, we have interactions for folks in our visitor center space that they can tell their stories, they can write them down. They, there's a prompt that they can, re, you know, say that what they're doing, what they'd like to see done. So then they can reflect and tell their stories a little bit and what they'd like to see happen. So we try to give space for that. So people um, and visitors can, cause they walk through this entire wealth of knowledge of about climate and what's happening and they're trying to process it, but they need the space at the end to like kind of, um, <clears throat> yeah, really just have that space to, um, process and emotionally <laughs> what, what's happening sometimes. Um, so, um, so that's kind of our approach to it. Um, we're trying, we're in the process. Um, some parts, some, um, members of our team are looking at redoing some of our climate labs, learning labs that we do, um, trying to tweak them a bit, um, and <clears throat> for students, because we're trying to, empower students to make change but we can't be advocacy so it's like we're trying to run we're trying to like tout that line and like recently like we've done um a few um part of climate week or um education week we've done we've highlighted youth voices and like just try to get ele basically give them a platform really but say this we're not telling them what to say, you know, we're not like, but, but we're giving them the platform to share what they're doing. And so we're trying to find ways to do it, but also it's that line that we're just trying to, we're, we're in the process of figuring it out, really. We're just ongoing. <laughs> yeah, I, it's, it's interesting that, um, you know, we've done a lot of NSF uh, funded grant work and now um, we've got our first at least our first in a long time uh, NOAA grant NOAA BWET grant which is pretty explicit about students taking actions <laughs> um, and you know pretty different in terms of I think what we can do within the confines of the NOAA grant compared to what we have done in and what we were told we could do within the confines of NSF uh, funding. 
um, of course, in for both of both federal agencies, um, we're talking about you've got to be true to the science. But um, but I think NOAA understands things a little differently than NSF and uh, does allow for uh, youth action and, and does actually foster youth action, which um, NSF is, I think, more leery of. We've created a workaround with a lot of our, um, cause we do climate action planning with our teens um, at all of our youth climate summits. Um, and, you know, we're really explicit saying like, we're not telling you what to do. We're just giving you this like buffet of all these different projects and actions and stuff that you could consider. And then you guys can come up with stuff on your own too. And then we're like, you know, youth voice. So we're not should, we don't, we say we're not shooting on them or like, you don't, you can't, you don't have to, you know, we're not telling you to go and do a carbon, you know, a, a, a carbon audit of your school or greenhouse gas inventory of your school. You can do that. Like we will give you the tools and help you do that. Or we've had, we've definitely had students like do the Fridays for future stuff, um, like march out of school on Fridays, but we didn't tell them to do that. They did it all and organize the whole thing on their own. Um, so we try to like, like be supportive, but also kind of like let them drive um, within, you know, certain parameters. Um, so it it is a pretty fine line that I'm constantly like, uh, are we crossing the line? Is it okay if we cross the line just a smidge and like, and then step back? Um, so it's just, it's interesting. And, and, you know, the line is constantly shifting too, depending on um, who's in office. Um, so that's another <laughs> challenge. Um I know we just have a few minutes uh, left. Eric, is your hand up from earlier, or do you did you have something you wanted to add? Oh, just a, a little bit. Um, yeah, Jen, great. Based on what you were saying earlier, um, yeah, same thing. Like not being advocates, we're working on a project in Oakland that's uh, it's called how how green is your school, and the idea is that the the youth are um, identifying ways that their schools are or not. On, are or are not sustainable and green or climate friendly. Uh, and so we're, it, you know, it's our, you know, our voice kind of for the entry point, but it's AP environmental science students and they're in this class for a reason. You know, there's four of these classes, that's actually seven at this school. So they're, uh, and then we center their voices first by doing something called a mind map and just having them unpack why they're in this class. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get into college. I need my AP stuff, but also I'm here because I care about climate because of these things. So centering their voice first, and then the ultimate goal is for them to sort of look at their own school and make recommendations, you know? Uh, and so co collecting empirical data to your point about citizen science, and there's so much we can do just engaging folks in informal spaces in just data collection, you know, what's, what's going on. Um, and I think the way we frame it, and I really appreciate your your point about centering student voice and not not pushing too much. And yet, students taking action we know is a huge piece of surmounting climate anxiety. So for those that are already invested and worried, like to be able to take action up front and to say, I did this assessment of my school, and this is what's missing. Or I looked at this other school; they've got this going on. I'd love to engage that practice here. You know, so. That that to me is really powerful because they you know they're collecting the data they're looking looking around making you know making observations putting the pieces together uh, and and most folks you know as far as controversy goes most folks would say more trees on campus is great you know regardless of what political leaning you are you know having having trees having better air as as you all shared are all things that we want right so the way we frame it. And to your point again about centering student voice and letting them identify the target areas that are really important to them, I think is really, really, really important. Uh, Tiffany, you wanna jump in? Yeah, just real quick, I know we're about to wrap up, but I think, um, you know, there's organizations, you know, like you were talking about Emily and then same for you, Don, that are constricted by federal dollars, but then there's organizations like us that have private funding with 501c3s. And so partnering, for example, Emily, after you work with a bunch of kids, right, having the teachers partner with us for that civic engagement piece around the science. So thinking about how do we, how do we bring together what we're all good at, right, in terms of 
linking the kids with their new science learning, with elevating their voices, with their student choice around how they want to um, engage with the community. We just took a bunch of kids out to those of you in uh, the, the Boulder area will know it, Jack's Solar Garden, and it's working on agrivoltaics. And our action afterwards was the kids all wrote to Senator Hickenlooper and Senator Bennett about a farm bill that's including money to fund agrivoltaics. And so, you know, they spend time learning about the science of agrivoltaics, and then they get to engage with advocating for it um, on a federal level. So, yeah, I think there's a way to bring together um, the science with the civic engagement and still have everyone following the letter of their funding. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Tiffany, for sharing that example. Any other, oh, it looks like we're right at two, so I want to respect everyone's time. Thanks for joining the clean call today. Um, next week, is there a topic uh, next week, Gina, or speaker or anything? Um, yes, it is, uh, oh, Tim's presentation, actually. Um, oh, great. Yeah, he'll be uh, sharing about his work about climate change course offerings. Great. And uh, hope, hoping to see some of you maybe at AGU, um, upcoming AGU in December. Um, I guess probably more coordination on that to happen. <laughs> but uh, happy Halloween, everybody, and have a great week. Thank you, Jen. Yeah, take care, everybody. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, everyone. Bye.